I welcome you all to this webinar on behalf of the World Council of Churches Management Team. We will start our meeting by reflecting on Psalm 8. The title of this psalm is Divine Majesty and Human Dignity. O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have founded a backwork because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep, and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh, sovereign God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. As we begin the series of the webinars on hate speech and white privilege, we thank God for reminding us that we are all created by God. We are created in your image, God, just a little lower than yourself. You have crowned every human being with dignity. You care about what happens to every person. We are important to you. That is why you sent your son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Thank you, God, because good life for every human being is not only in heaven. We pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we treat each other with dignity as you meant it to be. May these webinars help us look at each other and each human being as created in your image and therefore worthy of a, a dignified life. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. These webinars are part of the WCC long history of wanting to overcome racism and to focus attention on human dignity. In the past, the WCC played a significant role within the international anti-racism movement, extending solidarity to thousands of indigenous, racially and ethnically oppressed communities. Today, nearly 30 years after the collapse of apartheid in South Africa, we see a new phase and face of racism in recently em embroidered racist movements. White supremacy in the United States of America, Hindu nationalism in India, anti-Semitism in Europe and in North America, anti-migrants in the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, in Asia. All these are joining generations of oppression of the, of Roma people in Europe, the oppression of people of African descent and centuries of ill treatment of 
native and indigenous peoples around the globe. The Black Lives Matter movement is the most recent expression of resistance to global manifestation of the legacy of slavery, which has found an echo in different parts of the world. Now, there is a mandate you know, for this kind of work in the World Council of Churches. In most recent years, we go back to the WCC Central Committee meeting of June 2016, which recommended the implementation of a process to work together in addressing the issue of racism and transformation in significant ways. The WCC Executive Committee meeting of November 2017 observed that racism should become a more visible priority for action by the churches. They recommended that addressing racism ecumenically be a priority for the work of the World Council of Churches from 2018 to 2021. The WCC Executive Committee meeting of November 2018 affirmed their previous decision that racism should be the, the overarching global theme for the year 2019 in the common journey of the pilgrimage of justice and peace. The executive committee also recommended that the PJP theological study group meeting in Japan should address the theological underpinnings of racism. The WCC executive committee meeting of May 2019 asked the general secretary to present a concept paper in November 2019 on the issue of racism, discrimination, xenophobia, and ethnicity based on the learnings of the WCC work on racism that will be led to another programmatic initiative. The WCC executive committee co meeting of November 2019 also received the concept paper on programmatic initiative on overcoming racism, racial discrimination and xenophobia. The WCC executive committee meeting of June 2020 recommended that the interim general secretary closely monitor developments in this context and identify means of taking appropriate action in light of the gravity of this crisis and the urgent need to address its underlying root, root causes. They also approved the establishment of a transversal on overcoming racism which works closely with the churches and address racism as manifested in each region. Now, coming to the theological reflection on hate speech and whiteness. During the 2019 Tokyo Theological Forum on Racism, the International Group of Theologians and Leaders specializing in racism from Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Europe, Latin America, Middle East, North America, and the Pacific region confirmed that racism as a systemic reality is not only an individual prejudice, but it is also a pervasive and complex reality that protects the interests of the dominant culture and discriminates against ethnic, racial, religious, and class minorities. To further the work of overcoming racism, two overarching themes 
have been identified as key areas for ongoing theological reflection. These two broad themes are hate speech and whiteness. Members of the theological study group of the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace and participants of the Tokyo Theological Forum are invited to present a paper on one of the two themes. Given the experience of COVID-19 pandemic and also the current events, consideration is to be given to how racism is manifesting itself in this context. For example, how certain groups such as indigenous peoples or black people or other ethnic minorities, migrants are targeted and their situation exacerbated by COVID-19 and structural racism. Today's webinar will be moderated by Reverend Professor Dr. Fernando Enns, who is a member of the Central Committee. He is also a member of Association of Mennonite Congregations in Germany and the moderator of the reference group and the theological study group of the World Council of Churches Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. He is also professor of theology in the Faculty of Religion and Theology at the Free University Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So over to you, um, Dr. Fernando Enns. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel Fieri, our Deputy General Secretary at the World Council of Churches. Uh, it is great uh, to have the opening by Isabel Fieri uh, for this series of webinars. Uh, I welcome all of you, whoever is watching this, whoever is participating, worldwide audience, worldwide community. It is a privilege to uh, have you all uh, in this webinar. Uh, especially, I welcome, of course, the members of the Theological Study Group uh, for the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. And also, as it has been announced already, I welcome speakers uh, who come, who participated in the Theological Forum in Tokyo uh, that was organized by the World Council of Churches on the topic of racism. Um, we have uh, the possibility that uh, you, as the audience, uh, if, you, if you watch this, you can participate uh, in writing comments or questions into the chat room. Uh, that is most welcome. Of course, our time is very limited, so I will give preference to the discussion among the speakers themselves. Uh, nevertheless, feel free to comment uh, and contribute uh, if, if you want to. So that is a, a possibility of active participation. Um, the, what we want to do today uh, is focusing on the white privilege in COVID-19 and white supremacy in mission. Uh, and we have outstanding speakers uh, with us that, uh, whom I will introduce in a minute and also short responses uh, on each of uh, the, the papers. So we will, we will listen to two papers. Uh, and then uh, we will have responses on both of them. And if time allows, uh, some discussion uh, will be invited then as well. So the first speaker, uh, I have the privilege to introduce Reverend Yolanda Pantu. Uh, Yolanda is a minister of the Indonesian Church, Christian Church, uh, based in Jakarta. Yolanda is a member of the World Council of Churches Commission on Faith and Order and also in the ECHOS Commission, that is the, the Youth Commission of the World Council. She also participates in racial justice work at the World Council of Churches. Yolanda, welcome uh, very much. Uh, it's great to have you with us. And uh, we look forward to listening to your paper, which is, has the title Being Asian in the Time of COVID-19 Pandemic. Please go ahead, Yolanda. Thank you, Fernando, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an it's it's an honor for me to be part of this theological study group of Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. Just excuse me a second; I have to share. 
my screen. Yes. No, not this one. Just, okay. Um, share this. It works earlier. Mm, okay. Yes, it worked. Um, so, I will talk about the uh, the topic of uh, the white whiteness in the in time of pandemic of COVID nineteen from the perspective of an Asian person, not particularly my personal experience, but more of the reality worldwide. The COVID-19 has become a justification to express prejudice and hate in many places in the world. But this is not something new. Throughout the history of the pandemic among humankind, outbreaks were also accompanied by some sort of racism or racial, racial discriminatory. The idea of people of other cultural and ethnic background carry contagious disease can be traced back even to the time of the Great Plague in Europe, where it was at the time the Jewish people who were seen as the scapegoat, as the as the person who carried the uh, the sickness, the ill, the, the sickness. That is why the World Health Organization quickly named the virus uh, with COVID nineteen. They, because it happens in by, by the end of 2019 and throughout 2020. Although it originally appears in Wuhan, China, it was not named after the geographical place because they have learned from naming the virus Ebola, it has fortified the pre-existing racism and discrimination and social alienation towards people of African descent at that time. Unfortunately, the effort to separate the pandemic from blaming a certain group of people seems to be belittled by Donald Trump, the president of United States of America at this moment. He refused to use the official name of the virus in, in the beginning, rather he preferred to call it Wuhan virus, China virus, or Kung Fu. This immature attitude does not only show disrespect towards the effort on how to handle the pandemic seriously, but also become a threat towards a certain group especially the East Asian descent. It is not an exaggeration because since the outbreak began racism against the East Asian people, not only the Chinese communities, but also other Asian has grown exponentially. People who look Chinese are being yelled at, spat on, and even beaten. And not only in the United States, but also like, for instance, in the United Kingdom, an Asian student from Singapore was brutally attacked on the street that his face needs a surgery, needs surgery for recovery. Also in places like in Tokyo and in Rome, several eating places put announcement on their doors stating that visitors from China are not allowed to enter. Chinese people or other Asians in Australia also have their share in receiving and in the receiving end of racial discrimination. Not only they have faced racial slurs, but also eviction and rejection from medical clinics and classes. The Courier Picard, a French newspaper, issued a paper with headlines Alert Jaune or Le Peril Jaune, Yellow Alert, Yellow Peril. Question mark, complete with an image of a woman of East Asian ethnicity wearing a mask. The paper apologized afterwards, but it was too late because the discrimination has discrimination has been fortified. The the youth the, of Asian descent come back with the hashtag Genesuipaang virus. I'm not a virus. To, and it became a movement. It became a movement on social media to show how strong the discrimination was. The stigma and xenophobia do not stop in harassment on the street or juvenile uh, name calling, but also people who are facing this stigma also facing the possibility of losing their income, jobs, homes, and their livelihood. This discrimination also can also be traced back to the attack on the food culture or the culture itself. Before pandemic, before the pandemic begins the East Asian food culture has received a tiny hint of discrimination. Take MSG, for instance, it has become known as the Chinese restaurant syndrome. It is based on the assumption and belief that, not based on research, but basically stereotyping that all Chinese cuisine are unhealthy. 
The COVID-19 that has become the cause of our recent global pandemic likely first cropped out in humans around the Huanan Seafood Market, a wet market located in the city of Wuhan in the Chinese province of Hubei. But the reason alone has justified and reinforced the pre-existing assumption and stigma towards the Chinese food culture. Although it is true that some Chinese and other Asians do eat things considered as exotic, it were the media or the Western media and movies have made it worse. Because it is not true that everyone eats exotic food or eat exotic food on daily basis. This post of an, inter uh, an internet post about a Chinese a look-alike Chinese woman eating a bat went viral as uh, at the time of the pandemic began, but apparently this is not only not taken in China, it was also taken from 2016. Another example is like when the outbreak began in Italy, Italy was one of the countries where the breakout happened severely. However, there was never fear of going to an Italian restaurant in contrast with the fear of going or even ordering from Chinese re restaurant. It is not only about the food. They were afraid of the people who cook and serve those in those dining places. Many are afraid to come to the Chinese restaurant because they assume the people who work there might just came from China. But the same can be said towards Italian restaurant all over the world. This, was, this, this did not happen to the Italian restaurant, for instance. And the consumption of ex exotic food is also not something exclusive of Chinese or even Asian food culture. There are people who eat worms, crocodile, seal, kangaroo, whale, rabbit, deer, and others for their source of protein. And some of us might find them exotic or even hostile, but for them it is their food culture. Now, what does the COVID-19 xenophobia has anything to do with white privilege or whiteness? First of all, this is not saying that all the perpetrators of racism were only white people, as it happened. It also, uh, it, as it told by an American of Korean descent, he experienced discrimination by a Latino man wearing a cap labeled Puerto Rico. Uh, fortunately, the the, converse, the the interaction becomes amicably become amicable. But this photo is taken uh, from an air, from the airport in Bali during the swine flu pandemic, and the, these are tourists from Japan. At the time of the pandemic, uh, the, the swine flu pandemic, there were many people, uh, there were many casualties, but there was not such a lockdown as it is now, people still traveling, and there was, there was not recorded a discrimination to someone based on their skin color or nationality origin. origin. So, white, uh, just a second. white supremacy has long been existing. Historically, it took the form of Western European or European colonialism for South, Southeast Asian countries. In the spirit of the global pandemic, white supremacy may connote American racial superiority. However, I see it as actually denoting the long-standing historical and sociological bias of white people against Asian or various ethnic groupings. A professional photographer of Japanese descent has started a photo project of uh, 10 individual East Asian descent who, exper who experienced discrimination in the pandemic time. In her learning, she learned that discrimination happened to her is not something based on individual, and she was enlightened by the Black Lives Matter movement. So it was the Black Lives Matter movement that gave her the perspective that discrimination she experienced is something that is systemic. She said the protests have brought public attention to the idea that individuality is a luxury afforded to a privileged class, no matter how reckless their behavior or how consequential their action. In in, in the in the background of the pandemic of COVID nineteen, the Asian the group of Asian people, uh, sp uh, diaspora Asian, becomes aware of discrimination towards the other minority group. It's not a coincidence that the Black Lives Matter happened in the, in the year 2020, but Black Lives Matter movement peak in the year 2020, it becomes a awakening also for the Asian group. The Asian as a group has been depicted as the role model immigrants, especially because of their rather passive 
attitude in terms of political disputes. However, this also means that they might only take care of their own interests and have little care about systemic racism that take place towards other minority or marginalized group. So now when the table turn and they realize that it can happen to them as well, they learn one thing that we are all on this together. So the one good thing we can take from this pandemic and discrimination is that all lives matter, all lives matter, not in terms of I'm putting down Black Lives Matter, but to realize that when someone is being discriminated and we say nothing, it will happen to you as well one day. So it is very important for us to stand side by side against hate and racism. And uh, no, all, no one uh, can be seen as less uh, precious in the face of God, in the face of society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanda. Uh, this is very helpful. Of course, uh, your paper is much more extended and worked out uh, and that will be published later. This is true for all the papers uh, and presentations that you hear uh, during this time here together. Uh, so we will, we will be able then to follow up and, and learn more from you uh, for now. Thanks a lot. We have invited uh, uh, someone to respond. Uh, and this is Reverend Philip Binot Peacock. Philip is Executive Secretary for Justice and Witness at the World Communion of Reformed Churches uh, based in Hanover in Germany. Uh, Philip is an ordained deacon in the Church of North India. Uh, he works closely with the World Council of Churches on issues of economic and ecological justice. And he's also a member of the International Planning Group for the Global Ecumenical Theological Institute, that is the students program through the assembly, the 11th assembly of the World Council of Churches, which will take place in 2022. Philip, may I invite you to respond to Yolanda? You have to unmute, Philip. Sorry, I was muted. I had to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Enns. And thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Reverend Yolanda for her paper, in which she brilliantly and beautifully is able to prize open the politics of racism that COVID-19 has exposed to us. Her paper raises the important point of how pandemics are politicized, and used to scapegoat a particular community and how this has been used historically as well. She is able to well establish that it is done through a parochial lens that privileges a Eurocentricism and further normalizes it and makes it normative. Her paper moves away from the notion that racism is a matter of personal attitudes and she exposes the structural narratives that play a role in perpetuating racism. She further notes how the politics of food serves as a marker of cultural difference and becomes a pivot around which the Cotodian elements of racism revolve, leading actually to what we can refer to as the banality of racism. It further unravels the white privilege at work that normalizes the culture of the geopolitical North while at the same time exoticizing other cultures. This is particularly seen in the politics of food habits in which some foods are considered to be exotic and others normal based not on the food itself, but rather who is eating it. Coming from a context, India, in which there is a certain food fascism being played out, it was interesting for me to see these connections being made on a global level as well. The present global context is marked by three crises. The first one being the global COVID-19 pandemic. The second being the issue of racism and particularly how the Black Lives Matter movement is evolving. And thirdly, climate change. However, I believe that these three are actually deeply connected. All three of them deal with what to do with the other that is presented as being dangerous and deadly the virus, but also human bodies, and more so some humans as against others, as Yolanda has pointed out, is seen to be the deadly other. 
racialized communities are seen as a deadly other and pollution is seen as a dangerous deadly other as well. Mary Douglas in her work, Purity and Danger, suggests that human society is not just concerned about what enters and exists the physical body, the social body, and the cosmic body, but this concern actually serves as an organizing principle for societies. In our response to these three global crises, we note that the immediate reaction seems to be to exclude the other, close the borders, displace the pollution to another place, preferably a third world country. In such a context, I believe that Yolanda has done a wonderful piece of work where she's able to make strong and deep connections between COVID-19 and racism. I wish, however, that a paper also paid attention to the structural economic systems that make such othering possible and perpetuate systems of injustice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, uh, for this uh, quick response to Yolanda Pantu's paper and presentation. Uh, Yolanda, do you want to uh, respond to what you've heard uh, again? Uh, so I, I, can, I can give you a, a few minutes, both of you, Philip and Yolanda, to uh, engage in a, in a short discussion. Uh, yes, thank you for the very well um, response, uh, Philip, uh, and also your appreciation on what I have written. Uh, indeed, I haven't given much uh, thought, no, I haven't given much portion of the socioeconomic um, this differences that play a big part on how the pandemic uh, affects someone's life. I, I, and also how the socioeconomic background most of the time linked to someone's uh, ethnic ethnicity background. I will put that in, uh, in my paper for the correction. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Yolanda. I really appreciate your paper, and particularly the part where you go into this politics of food. I mean, I think uh, these markers of racism are found in the everyday, in the mundane. And I really like the fact that you exposed it in this particular way. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, I come from a culture where the eating of sausages would actually be quite uh, unusual. Uh, why would you eat uh, intestine, for example? Of course, I mean, tripe is, is, is an important part of many parts of Indian cuisine as well, but what goes as normative and, and what is seen as exotic is something that I, I really like how you fleshed that out. So thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I realized myself, Yolanda, that you, uh, at, at some point, I think you use in your paper uh, the, the terminology of exotic food uh, and without you know marking it as as a use of terminology from a distinct perspective mm -hmm. um, so who is in fact uh, you know defining what is exotic whatever that means uh, and and what is not exotic uh, I thought that is also that is also interesting how we how we use language I mean someone like you who is who is really into the topic and uh, uh, and skilled. Uh, and I also saw that I had the, had the privilege to read some of the papers beforehand. And every now and then I realized that uh, even people who are dealing and researching with, with these topics that we're discussing now, uh, sometimes here and there it slips. Our terminology is, is, is telling so much about how we, how we are part of a mentality that is simply using uh, some, some words uh, like Philip was also pointing out now, you know, what is normative? What is, what, who defines what is the norm? Uh, how do we construct the other? How is the other always, always a constructed uh, uh, some, someone? And, uh, and how do we define ourselves then on the basis of that? But that also goes with, with, with words like exotic. What is exotic? What does that mean? It's uh, what is exotic for one is, is not exotic for the other. And I, I realize it's very much a Western uh, term, I, I believe, uh, to, to use. Anyway, this, uh, this is just a minor remark, uh, Yolanda. Well, I, I did put saying something, um, definition of what is exotic itself should be revisited. Very good. And in, very, in the, very it's good. Not, sometimes it's also not only the food, but also how you present it, like 
in some countries people eat the whole fish in some other countries people has to chop the head and the tail so it doesn't look like a fish right. and otherwise the kid will not eat it <laughs> right yeah, yeah. no it's uh, it's uh, it's fascinating how you how you investigate this this whole whole uh, uh, perception around food uh, and 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 how much that is telling us about about ourselves and our prejudices our stereotyping and so on so thanks again are there are there some other comments from other uh, members here in the in the group questions you would like to add some something feel free this is we have we have a few minutes susan susan derber from the united kingdom go ahead susan Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda, for a brilliant paper. Good to see you. Um, I was struck too how the language of dirt and cleanliness, purity, um, is so often a part of racist discourse and how that can be exacerbated when, when something like an infection, a pandemic, is comes into the mix so that somehow the language we use about infection then becomes part connected to and, and, and mixed up with the language that informs racism. So I was really struck by um, the way that the language of racism without a pandemic is often about dirt, but, but when there is a pandemic that it kind of turns up the volume. But the other thing I wanted to ask was whether you had any, whether you can think of any biblical passages that might um, challenge or redeem or offer hope into the situation that you're, you're describing so well? It's a good question. I, I have, I don't have, I mean, like, it's, it's a bit dangerous to pick a story because, you know, at this moment, because we are not done yet with the pandemics with this with our struggle but i remember the story of naaman um, the general uh, the syrian general who came for uh, yeah. to be healed by uh, elisa and how this pandemic uh, how pandemic can affect anyone with power uh, with money you know like uh, um, from whatever nationality and how it is very hard to, to for him to be healed to, to be cleansed in the river, in, in the Israelite river, because he thinks like it's not a better river than a river in my hometown. So there's also a slide of, you know, like seeing like I, my my river is better than, uh, it's, it's cleaner than your river. But you know, like in this in this struggle together that there's no, we should have, we should not have borders anymore. You know, like we are all on this together. So maybe that, that's the story that comes into my mind. Yeah, I think that's a very helpful story. Yes, could be. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Susan. Do you do you have uh, when you ask this question? I'm I'm sure you you have uh, biblical passages in your head uh, that uh, that you associate with that, or am I wrong? Mm. Well, um, I mean, I think the one that Yolanda named is a very good one because it's about foreigner and you know not not being able to tolerate what he would regard as a dirty river mm. but um i was also thinking of the um the canaanite woman the woman from syria who you know um who's described as a you know almost the metaphor of a dog again a dirty image um whether that and, and jesus kind of changing his um, yeah, being challenged to change how he addresses the needs of the world. So, yeah, I was thinking about that, one, but it was a generally, a genuinely open question. Um, I hadn't got a hidden answer, um, but I, I'm just aware that in the Bible too, there are lots of stories of racism and fear of the other, which are also often bound up with disease. So, you know, we blame the other of another community for the disease. Um, right. And how does, you know, G I'm thinking of Jesus welcoming the leper, Jesus touching those who others thought were dirty. Um, there's lots of potential there, I think. Right. 
Yeah, yeah and it's and it's uh, and uh, now you are you're reminding us also of the fact that uh, quite often this is even connected to food. Uh, you know mm. how to what the judgment of what is clean and what is unclean. Yeah, uh, and that is uh, you know that is of course a very very much built into religious systems uh, but what we what we sometimes do not see and what Yolanda is showing us actually is that well this is not just a question a religious or a theological question of what is clean and what is unclean it is there's always an attachment to individuals who are producing or eating that kind of food so what does it say about the person uh, and about the relationship Uh, then this is uh, this is what I see you uh, pointing us to, Yolanda, and that's uh, in in a in a globalized world where we are so much used to go to international restaurants uh, of all kinds. It is quite uh, uh, an eye opener, I want to say, uh, to to be alerted to the fact that there's it's not just about food. This is about our relationships in the in the international community. So thanks a lot, uh, Yolanda. Thank you very much. Is there one more question on, on this one? Elizabeth Joy. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you, Thank you Linda, for your paper. Um, you know, it once again reiterates food and identity and how it impacts uh, uh, and informs racism, casteism, and it brings it very close to our heart, especially for uh, people at the margins. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, so let's move on. I mean, there, there's there's more to to say about this. Uh, thanks again, also Philip, to your to your uh, great response and for for initiating this uh, small discussion. Uh, we want to move on uh, to our next speaker. Uh, this is Reverend Dr. Peter Crutchley. Uh, he's the Secretary of Mission Development. And the council uh, at the Council for World Mission. Uh, Peter is a member of the United Reformed Church in the United Kingdom. He works closely with the World Council of Churches, also like uh, Philip, on economic and ecological justice, uh, but also mission and evangelism and racial justice. And if I'm not mistaken, Peter, you are sitting in Singapore now. No, not anymore. I'm now moved. Okay. I'm now a citizen of the United Kingdom all over again. Okay, welcome to Europe again, I would say. Uh, True. Not really, not really sure what I'm saying there. Um, Peter, yeah. thank give, you. Us, give us your paper, please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, friends. Marcelo is going to share the, the one slide I just want to keep up in the first part of my um, presentation. So, friends, you should situate this paper within the, the wider work of Council for World Mission on the legacies of slavery that we're exploring in our organization and builds um, further on the kind of overall project sharing I did when we met in uh, Tokyo last year. And this is to bring to you um, a painting that's in our archive um, called The Healer. And um, you can see uh, on the screen, I think, the uh, some of the, the details of uh, what we want to, to explore. So I just need to um, find my own text as we speak to this. So, yeah, it, this is yet another of the treasures um, <laughs> from our, our archive that um, helps to uh, explicitly name racism within the mission endeavor of white European Christianity, particularly. And whilst we've been talking in the title of our um, uh, event these days about hate speech, uh, it's to unmask visualization of whiteness um, in many forms um, and to see hate speech as more than text. So what I'm trying to do in the paper is just through a couple of examples from our materials as a missionary organization to surface the racist presumptions of white supremacy and offer then a mirror to the emerging white figure that's portrayed there. And I'll do that through a key biblical character who embodies and alerts us from the beginning to the fruits of whiteness when it behaves like this. So you can see in the, um, in the painting uh, on the slide there, 
The drama is clear. There is a white missionary doctor bending over a poor African child, bringing healing and a white Jesus who stands at the elbow of this doctor and is empowering the uh, healing work that's done there. And uh, the drama and the subtext is very clear that thanks to the LMS, the London Missionary Society medic, this child has been saved from pain and is offered an even greater healing from Christ himself, life eternal. So this is a picture that was um, produced for the London Missionary Society at our um, request. It's also listed in the Welcome um, uh, Foundation's collection, and they saw it as an early form of product placement, because and this is their description of it. An idealized white missionary, guided by Christ standing behind him, applies Western medical knowledge to the healing of a sick African child. The missionary has a medicine chest identical in type to the tabloid medicine chests which the firm of Burroughs Welcome made for explorers and missionaries. In the foreground is the discarded African surgical instrument, the horn, and the white missionary resembles Henry Morton Stanley, as portrayed in a wood engraving published in the Illustrated London News. So the Welcome Foundation could see this connection with their profit, you know, with this work as well. So LMS used art as a key tool to reach the many hundreds of churches and chapels in the UK, but also beyond the UK across the mission field. And this is part of a series of paintings called Famous Beautiful Pictures, which were sold for profit for LMS funds and projects. And they announced the desire by LMS to locate their imagery in all possible locations where people's hearts, minds and pockets could be touched. To underscore the message, LMS commissioned an author, Vera Walker, to write a story to accompany it. And it's called Sindano and the Good Chief, and it centers on this painting. In my full paper, I try to give more detail to this. In our presentation today, I'll just quickly paraphrase. So you can imagine, Sindano is a 10-year-old boy, um, in, uh, an African boy in this village, who's meeting with the missionary doctor and his native evangelist, leads him to turn away from his African ways and turn to Jesus, for it is his brother who is the poor child who is healed in the painting. And Vera Walker introduces Sindano in this way. The sun was setting over the far off cluster of date palms as Sindano, the brown African boy, trudged along the narrow path in the high grass towards the village where he lived. And that's when we enter the drama of this painting that you can see. Sindano saw his own mother come towards the doctor, carrying in her arms his little brother. She laid him down on the grass and a look of pity came over the doctor's face. He poured something into a glass, gave it to the little boy. There was no sign at first, but then Sindano's brother slowly opened his big eyes and smiled. See, see, said the man with the bandaged arm to Sindano. He lives. What new witchcraft is this? Sindano leaned forward with sparkling eyes. The story continues from the painting. There is not just healing here, of course, but conversion. And that night, when the people all gather and the missionary comes, they sing a hymn and Sindano joins in. The great good doctor is here. His name is Jesus, is the song. Marcelo, perhaps you can take down the, the slide at this point, because the story of Sindano doesn't end with the healing, neither does it end with the conversion of Sindano and the realization by Sindano there is a greater power and civilization here in the shape of this white chief. Because the, the story doesn't conclude there. Instead, it concludes with, as you can imagine, a kind of financial altar call. This is about recruitment. It's about fundraising. It's about meeting the, the needs of missionary capitalism of a global mission society. It finishes in these kind of ways. Will the doctor come again, it asks, in the scattered villages of Africa, in the million villages of India, you know, they suffer untold pain and misery and they know nothing of the story of the good chief. 
Sometimes there is only one doctor for hundreds of miles of wild country. How can he visit these people? Cannot they come to hospital? Well, yes, if there were enough hospitals. But every hospital is full and each needs doctors and nurses and a big supply of medicines and bandages. So we call ourselves followers of the good chief. What are we going to do? And obviously the message is, you're going to give your money and you're going to offer yourself into missionary service. And it's clear that the global mission endeavour of a white Jesus needs white capital and white bodies, especially for the occupation, co-option and consumption of black lands, capital and bodies. I want to just turn back to the context and history of the painting, The Healer, its tranquility and tenderness seems clear, but it's ironic because it's actually painted at the height of World War I. It's painted 1916, 1917. And with all that's becoming clear from places like the Somme and the potential disillusionment with white civilization, what is this painting telling us? That the missionaries are quick to buttress the established order with the reminders of the divine equivalence to whiteness and reassuring everyone of white enlightened beneficence. And what's curious too is that whilst this painting is, co is commissioned and painted in 1917, the, the famous beautiful pictures collection the LMS brings together from other works of the same artists and others is in, is in 1936, 1937, when Europe is under the clouds of, of mounting fascism, um, the Spanish Civil War, um, Hitler's invaded the Ruhr and, um, and all of that that this again is used as a kind of an appeasement to whiteness, a reassertion of the white savior mythology when the mask has fallen from what white culture and civilization is really like, the second global war within 20 years. So the task is to urgently include mission and mission movements shaped by whiteness in the critique, which is not new of um, racism and colonialism in mission, but also in the conversion. And that is the thing that is as yet unseen. How and when will we convert this mission movement we are part of? So Sindano, our fictional friend is made to believe Jesus is white, but Jesus was brown like Sindano. So who is the white person Sindano should know from the Bible? In fact, who is the only white man in the Bible at all? And his name is Pontius Pilate. So we know Pilate, he's a military man. Pilatus was a sobriquet, which meant he was skilled with the javelin. Pontius indicates he belonged to the Ponti family from southern Italy, who had historic and bloody roots in Roman life and politics. Pontius Aquila was an assassin of Julius Caesar and was a tribune of the plebs, which suggests that the family was originally of plebeian origin. They were common people. And Pilate's family were social climbers who knew how to do well out of the imperial system. So what does his single embodiment of whiteness reveal about whiteness? So we see whiteness in him in toto, as it were. Colonial, military, governing, financial and legal power all come to rest in one body, pilots. And this centering of all forms of influence, power and truth on him is the clearest reflection of what whiteness claims to be the norm, the power, the truth. So I want to also notice some particular facets of Pilate's character in the last part of my presentation. There's his system building and, cl and social climbing, and I recognize his whiteness and my whiteness in this. Pontius, pleb no more Pilate, is a reminder that whiteness is a system which has deep-rooted, long-standing global ambitions and pretensions to organize, systematize, and hierarchize, and replicates these systems and pretensions endlessly. It's designed, like Sindano and the Good Chief story, to occupy whiteness and blackness and all races in between. There is Pilate's prevaricating, and I recognize his whiteness and mine in that. Pontius, I didn't have a dream, but my wife did. Pilate lacks the moral courage to act on what is self-evidently the rigged trial of an innocent man. He doesn't need his wife's dream to reveal the injustice of inequality and oppression any more than we needed the dream of Martin Luther King, but he cannot act to betray or confront a system that is his master and his mistress. 
upholding law and order. And this is also a place where I recognize whiteness. The moment that makes up the mind of Pontius, I am the governor Pilate, is when the crowd gets nasty. The plebs become restless. So we need to notice Pilate's ironic class betrayal here. When they threaten riot, when the plebs rise up, he casts them down. And the action that must be taken is that an innocent person of color is automatically, instinctively, carelessly tossed to his fate in yet another act of state-sanctioned police violence. Well, what is Pilate famous for? It is his hand washing, this clever and shameless political act. Pontius, my hands are clean, Pilate, embodies white evasion of responsibility and culpability which has allowed us as white people to point the finger of blame at our victims, who we have portrayed as unhuman, uncivilized, unworthy. Thus the racists blame black people for crime, violence, poverty, and so on. And our system rewards its victims with even more of the same thing. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the United Kingdom tweeted on the 12th of June, 2020, we cannot now try to edit or censor our past. We cannot pretend to have a different history. The statues in our cities and towns were put up by previous generations. They had different perspectives, different understandings of right and wrong. But those statues teach us about our past with all its faults. To tear them down would be to lie about our history and impoverish the education of generations to come. In exactly the way Johnson doesn't mean white people do need to engage in history telling, which does not give us exception from the post-colonial critique, but owns the over 400 years of white violence our dominant cultural forms have prospered. A history which reads how white men and white male dominant systems have continued to play the role of pilot. And this intervention into white culture will come through telling the truth, not lies about our history. From this truth telling, a consciousness of white history, sin and story, temptations, urges and stratagems can emerge. And this might stop the bastardizing people of color into representations like Sindano, and even stop the murdering of people like Breonna Taylor and mitigate the weight of injustice and inequality heaped on communities and nations of color. To do so means to address white uh, exceptionalism and missionary exceptionalism, that we are somehow exempt. And if anybody is doubly exempt and therefore doubly to blame, it is myself as a white missionary. But white people might look through pilot and find in Pilate's wife, the only white woman in the Bible, the means to decenter and recenter and meaningfully back the cause for the emancipation of all those who are the victims of white systemic extrajudicial violence and participate in healing the harm and demons savage whiteness has unleashed and perpetuates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, uh, very impressive uh, paper, very critical uh, on, on the mission history story that, uh, that continues uh, to play a huge role. And, uh, and the fascinating ex ex exegesis on, on Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate, I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised uh, in, in many regards, but I'm not the one who is invited to respond here. Uh, I'm simply the moderator. Uh, we have uh, another speaker, another respondent uh, to this paper. This is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Joy, who is a member of the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church, originating in India. Elizabeth is now based in the United Kingdom. Uh, her research interest focuses on identities of the marginalized and its relevance to liberation and transformation of communities. Uh, she serves the churches together in England as a director and a trustee. She's a member of the Council of Reference and Advisory Body to the Board of Trustees at British Student Christian Movement as well. Uh, and there are many other things to say about you, Elizabeth, uh, but uh, 
we will keep it to that for the moment. Please respond to Peter's uh, paper. Thank you, Fernando. Um, can I have the PowerPoint uh, at this time, please? Thank you. Um, Peter, I would like to thank you very much at the outset and deeply appreciate you. Next slide, please. First of all, for articulating some of the mission points, especially focusing on occupation, co-option, and consumption of black capital and black bodies. And also for broadening perspectives by being introspective, reactive, and provocative. You know, this initiates a process definitely beyond the stages of denial and defense. And thirdly, for choosing the painting, the healer that shows potential for uh, changing trends in some of the dominant Christian theologies. Of course, I'm sure a contrasting picture would change the language and uh, uh, point to holistic healing, I feel. So this picture, this painting opens up wider discussions and I thank you for that. Daring to weave the past mystics and you do that from the whiteness related to pilot to the mission activities of LMS. And once again, this opens wider discussion and we still need to see how communities around the world would respond to this. Finally, I would like to thank you and appreciate you for embracing possibilities to a way forward. This paper shows this at many points and specifically I like uh, your critique, which says there is not just healing, but conversion. I really like it because only healing leads us to better our interfaith relations. And of course, the reverse of uh, uh, this conversion first and then healing is also there. And only healing, you know, when we take uh, uh, the miracles of the Canaanite woman or the centurion, where uh, Jesus praises them, there is no e expectation of a conversion. So you open up a wide door and I thank you for that. The next slide. Yeah. Challenges obstructing a way forward. I would say, first of all, while you amplify some of the mission aspects mentioned earlier, occupation, co-option, and consumption um, of the black bodies and the black capital, uh, you seem to neglect repentance, reparation, and reconstruction uh, to the extent that um, uh, I or a person belonging to the communities at the margins would uh, love to listen to, at least a perspective from them. And then this paper seems to be blocking the body that is diseased and diseased to have the right to speak about healing and being healed. This I feel is the epistemic privilege of the marginalized and uh, Therefore, it would have been nice to hear their perspective too coming out. Um, combating white supremacy only on the lines of color may not be enough. Um, it is important to challenge the white supremacy, but still we need to go beyond that because um, uh, when 
one color rules over and denies and deprives the other. I feel that is in the ideology of power, coupling with color and privilege. Uh, you seem to unpack it, but it needs, we need a lot more work to be done. But of course, I understand the limitation uh, with the time and the constraints of uh, uh, the limitations to the number of words, everything limits it. And finally, deploying a story that dilutes the process as well as the impact uh, of white supremacy. I feel that the story of uh, pilot being used in this paper um, in one way dilutes what we are aiming to do. Um, I really feel that, yeah, you claim that pilot is the only uh, white person mentioned in the Bible. Um, instead of, you know, for, for me, what about uh, Herod Antipas? Herod Antipas, uh, um, you know, he shows the abuse of power and uh, the killing of children, uh, the massacre that happens even at the birth of Christ. Uh, could we have that story? Will that relate it a little more? So, so it's just a wide thinking. It's just a wide thinking. Um, for me, the problem of using pilot is also, um, it deroutes the focus of this paper because Pilate at one point also uh, exonerates Jesus. We see the Bible uses a lot of good things about Pilate, at least to some extent, it's not totally bad. And then where do we go? But Herod Antipas, uh, we still look at him as a person who uh, conveyed uh, the power of communication. Or he communicated power so well, the abuse of power. Could we have that? Next slide, please. Okay, now, I would just like to also uh, give suggestions for uh, the theological study group from this paper. Um, Avoid compromising the potential and possibilities of um, experiencing Jesus from one's own culture in a mission engagement from any community with values for fullness of life for all. You do that from your paper, from your perspective, but bringing in the other perspectives is going to enrich. And then build the process of understanding history, unlearning, unpacking. Um, uh, Peter, you were uh, mentioning about the white people engaged in uh, telling history. It is important, but I think it is equally important for uh, white people to listen to the history being unpacked by other communities. And that would, uh, uh, really help in engaging, whether it is our mission or doing theology, that is going to help us. And uh, construct theologies that overcome positivity attributed to whiteness and negativity to black. I think that is the calling of our time. It has, it has gone on from time immemorial. And we see that happening today, day after day, day after day, people crying out for liberation, crying out and saying, I can't breathe. And how are we going to theologize that? Slide, please. Uh, I mentioned about uh, an alternate paint. See, uh, using the same painting that we have used and hearing from, uh, from different aspects, from different uh, uh, communities, it's going to enrich our journey. 
And for me, I just thought, for me, this painting speaks louder. Um, as I said, this points to a holistic healing, physical, mental, social, and spiritual, okay? Communication of power is definitely seen in the picture that you, painting that you used, and we need that. But I feel here that the power of communication is revealed from the cross. It's an emaciated body. It's a bruised body. It's just the contrast of the other one. So healing is not uh, just physical. That is required by black people or uh, uh, Asians. No, healing is, uh, all of us are in need of healing. And the bruised body of Christ, the emaciated body of Christ brings that total healing and fullness of life for all of us. It is inclusive. But then I thank you profusely for taking us into this journey, for opening our eyes, for opening our ears, opening our hearts to respond to, to look in different ways and journey together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, that was a, that was a huge response, uh, I must say. Um, Peter, can I ask you, uh, is it okay if we bring in Anthony here as well? Uh, because Anthony has shared uh, uh, some, some wisdom here in the chat already. Anthony, ready? Um, feel free to, to tell everyone what you, what you wrote there. I think that's, uh, that's quite helpful. Yeah, I mean, I take the point that Elizabeth made, but I will make a qualitative difference between Herod and Pilate. Herod is colluding with empire, and there's nothing new in that. There's, there's lots of examples of indigenous peoples who make deals with oppressive power and, and abuse power. But in the end of the day, it's Pilate who condemns Jesus to death. Pilate is wrong. Pilate is a Roman apparatchik, and I accept that he exonerates Jesus, but that then only shows the hypocrisy, because having exonerated him, <laughs> he then still condemns him to death. Pilate cannot, sorry, Herod cannot condemn him to death, because Herod is not empire. Herod does not have the power. That's why they have to bring him to Pilate in the first place. Therefore, I think, with all due respect, I think Elizabeth has kind of missed the point, because it's not simply about the abuse of power, it's about who has absolute power. And absolute power, untrammeled power, rests with Pilate. And that therefore reflects whiteness in terms of empire. That's not about people who collude. People collude all the time. But they don't have absolute power. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Peter. <laughs> um, I'm, I've had the chance to give a presentation, so I don't want to spend too long, and others, I think, will want to speak. But let me just set this in a in a kind of context so for me the focus of this consultation is around whiteness that's a difficult concept for white people right um so i'm still processing in all of my introductions now in international events whether i could say i'm a white theologian and what that would mean so i'm so my search has been if you like to to wonder about where do I find mirrors to my whiteness in, this, in these kinds of texts? Um, and where is it in this endeavor that mission organizations have to say that healing and conversion happens when you become aligned to whiteness? So I think that, so, so for me, that's the kind of key point of all of this paper really is to say, well, what do we do with this, this image of this mask of whiteness that white people have constructed? And it's been for ourselves as much as it's been for everybody else. That's been my point about the missionary materials. It's about occupying whiteness as much as anything else. But how to maintain this rhetoric of whiteness through a century of two global wars prospered by white colonial expansionism and so on. So, so my point of of exploring this painting and bringing in Pilate is to use this as an uncomfortable mirror for myself and my culture and civilization and to mission as it's been aligned with it. So I think, you know, in response to, to Elizabeth, just to reiterate those, those things and then perhaps colleagues can want to share on other parts. 
Thank you. Uh, I see Elizabeth eager to, to respond again. Uh, let's uh, hold on, Elizabeth. I, I will bring you in again. Uh, let's see if someone else is uh, wanting to or feeling the urge to, to comment. Tiniku, Tiniku Maloleke from South Africa. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, the, this, uh, I don't think we should make it a pilot versus Herod uh, thing. It's not either or, uh, in my view, because um, such is the power of whiteness that whiteness seldom operates between and among whites alone. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a system. Mm -hmm. And that system can take on all the, 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 the people who collude uh, must not be so distinguished that we take them out of the system because the system succeeds by ensuring that it gets buy-in among the very people who are being oppressed. And, and Herod may symbolize that. And, and what, is, uh, what is absolute power anyway? Um, power is never completely absolute for too long because wherever power exists, it, it's constantly not only being challenged, but also being dispensed so as to make sure that it continues and it is dispensed to several of the people who then become, if you like, uh, representatives of whiteness, being white self. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Tiniku. Well, this, is, uh, this becomes a huge discussion about many topics. Elizabeth, do you want to, do you want to sharpen uh, that again? Uh, but yeah. uh, keep, it, but, keep it short, yeah. if, you, if you may. Uh, I would like to, first of all, thank Professor Anthony for his uh, uh, point. Uh, I agree when he says uh, um, Herod colluded with the power, but at the same time, uh, I lean towards uh, Maluleke's uh, point and then say power is abused. We see Pilate colluding with common people uh, and uh, executing their wish, but ultimately doing what was unjust and not right. And this is where I see the strategy of uh, uh, assimilation and annihilation. That is what Pilate is doing, getting the common people's view, but then crushing them. Uh, and uh, Peter, I definitely share with you uh, the pain, you know, that all of us go through in this journey. And, uh, oh, we still need to journey together to. and we know we will be there. Sorry. We are all with you and we know that you have taken this step and we deeply appreciate you for mm. that. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, I mean, um, yeah, okay. I'm just, <laughs> for, for, so literally for, for me, the question, the, the issue has been, there's an assumption that Jesus is white. That's the drama of the painting. That's the theology of the painting, right? So that leads to the question, of course he wasn't white. So who is white <laughs> in the text? And that's not, that is a systemic question. Um, but I think for white people then that becomes a personal question. So if we're going to do some work on um, re-imagining whiteness and, and repenting whiteness, where do we go? To whom shall we go? Now we cannot go uh, to Pilate, though, because we do we know that all too well. But maybe we can go to Pilate's wife. And I think that's just you know in the time we had, there was too little time to to amplify that point, because the point around Pilate is also a point around masculinity, and uh, white male expansionism and, and so on. So all of these things I think are kind of. Um, I really to offer you in some um, in some um, vulnerability. I, I think that you know how poorly prepared white people are to construct and deconstruct, and white men are perhaps is better to say um, questions of of identity, 
collusion, power, and, and so on, and why institutions like missionary organizations become very convenient places for our personalities to play out our dreams. Thank you. I, I, can, can I ask you uh, something, Peter? Uh, oh, sure. And this is, this is following up on, on, on what Elizabeth said earlier, um, that there is, there is some uncomfort uh, that I also feel, and I, I, I was wrestling with that while listening to you, not because you say something wrong, but because mm. I thought, yeah, there is, isn't there a risk to, to again be one-sided in, in one way? And I, I, and I, I mm -hmm. saying that with all, you know, yeah, <laughs> this, this will be mis, misunderstood and this will be misleading, maybe, maybe and so on. But Elizabeth has helped me to find the right words, I guess, and that is, uh, Elizabeth says, uh, the epistemic privilege of the marginalized. So uh, what I heard you saying, Elizabeth, is that uh, in, when we look at a painting like that, do we also have to listen to the healed body, the one that is healed, uh, and allowing that at least to add uh, comments to our comments? So that we don't run the risk again of, uh, you know, we white uh, male uh, privileged uh, people to now self-critically analyze uh, our history uh, and uh, finding out, you know, how terrible everything was and so on. And it was terrible. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And, and there's, uh, I mean, it's systemic racism all the way through. That's, uh, that's clear. Uh, but what, what I don't want to miss is then also, you know, or my question is actually, can I allow myself to do it this way? Or do I always have to, should, shouldn't I always invite, in this case, the healed body to help me also to, to, to get the broader picture of, of it? So that, I, so that I don't, in a, in a specific way, you know, follow the same pattern uh, of, of this whiteness uh, that is so much built into my mentality. I'm, do, you, do you see what I'm wrestling with? Peter. Only to say, my, yes, I do. And I understand, I understand it. And um, my, my paper brings, brings a, a book from, you know, Vera Walker, who, as it were, tries to, to use this. But it's really a form of traduction. It's really a form of co-option. The, the Sindano and the Good Chief is told really about the epistemic privilege of the marginalized. This is what happened, you know, I'm healed, I'm converted, I've embraced a new civilization, a new culture. So we have this tactic, but it still gets, you know, suborned into the colonial project. So, so for me, I'm still re reluctant to work around too much around this theme of, of, of healing. So how we, how we have to um, still sit, I think at one level for white people, we still have to deal with we cannot rush to forgiveness, you know? There still has to be this kind of en engagement, I think, um, to critique ourselves and therefore learn our own tricks that we use, like the story of Sindano, you know, <laughs> that somehow baptizes it all as a good thing. So, the, it's all, you know, it, it's, it, this, we are so smart at, at screwing things up, you know? I, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm wanting, I think, to kind of, uh, alert myself to that at least i suppose in this way of working right yeah well, thank, no, you. Thank, thank you thanks thank a you. lot uh, peter i mean it, it reminds us also of, of a presentation of tiniku maluleke uh, that uh, tiniku gave us uh, in our tokyo consultation you know you, you remember uh, when tiniku spoke about racism en route Mm. And how that always finds new, and it's it's uh, since then I've been thinking about it. How it always finds new ways, and it always sneaks in again and uh, and again. So that is really, um, yeah. It's I mean I I want to pay as much attention to that as as possible. Um, thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, I want to uh, come back at the end of this session, uh, bring back in one more question that was actually. Uh, that we've had in the chat uh, for Yolanda. Um, going back to, you know, the, the minority groups uh, in general and racism against minority groups. Um, the question was, Yolanda, do you see any chance that um, 
minority groups will show more solidarity to each other in the future in this fight against uh, uh, racial discrimination. And in, in, in this question, there was special reference to uh, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and uh, you know, discrimination against Asian or people of Asian descent. Is that, uh, is that something you envision or is that, how, how would you comment on that? Uh, that, that's something that I dream of to be happen, but uh, it's I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, like not being pessimistic, but but it's uh, I saw the, the I saw the question in the, in the chat uh, in the chat room. It, it said like against the majority. So I think I think we all, what we can do is to lift up the term minority and my majority because like. Um, Majority is a term of number, and you know, like to, in speaking of majority, the majority are the one who's been discriminated. If we're talking about numbers, so I think it's really important for us to talk more about. We are all on this together, and uh, you know, um, uh, just uh, erase uh, limitation and borders, and to see how we can work together on what is important on what, uh, you know, like health, welfare, justice, peace. And it doesn't matter what you are and where you come from. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, well, this is, uh, this is an, a fascinating discussion and definitely is, um, not more than a start uh, into this whole week of, uh, of webinar sessions. Um, let me thank you for, for today, uh, special thanks to Yolanda for, for a very good and, and uh, solid paper uh, reminding us of, of yeah, racism against Asian people and, and all the connections you made to, to the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, very helpful and, and uh, being responded by um, Philip uh, Peacock, um, great. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a gift to to have your insights. Really, it's uh, it's it's very rich. Peter, thanks for your paper, and the, I think this image will stay with us now for a while, uh, and we we can continue to yeah to meditate about that. And uh, Elizabeth, uh, your uh, uh, yeah extensive response to, to bringing in all the different uh, perspectives again and facets that we that we uh, shall not forget. Uh, thank you all for contributing uh, today. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will continue. Uh, so we will have each day of this week, uh, we will meet uh, until Friday uh, for a webinar session. Uh, and on the screen, you see now the announcement of tomorrow's session. It will be uh, more the focus then on the legacy of slavery, structural racism and religion. Uh, and you can see already that uh, uh, my colleague Tiniku Maluleke, but also Iva Karuthers uh, and Jennifer Martin from Jamaica. Uh, these will be the, the three speakers that we have in different uh, functions and they will react to each other. Um, so that, will, that is something that uh, allows us to continue the debate that, uh, that we have started here on, uh, on whiteness and on hate speech. That is the overarching topic, but uh, we see how, how many different uh, elements and perspectives we have to uh, we have to uh, pay attention to, and therefore it is absolutely necessary that we, as we come in, within the ecumenical family, we come from the different narratives, the different stories, the different contexts. Um, the richness is that we that we bring in these uh, these reflections from our own perspective, and we have the forum here to share that. That is. That is always the gift of this uh, <clears throat> ecumenical fellowship, and I and I cherish that a lot. Uh, let's uh, close this session then today with a short moment of prayer. Uh, I invite you for a moment of silence, and I will close it, and then we can say goodbye. Let's pray. God, we give thanks to this rich moment, this session, the speakers, the wisdom that you have given to all of them, 
to contribute to this topic. That is not just a theoretical question, but it is a question of practice, of life, of discipleship for us. We feel reminded that we are all built in your image, and that is what gives us our dignity undestroyable in your eyes. Bless us as we move into this day in our different contexts and be with each one of us, also the worldwide fellowship, the ecumenical fellowship on this day and beyond. Amen. Friends, see you tomorrow, hopefully. Be well, go in peace. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye.